Thanks for that introduction, Buddy. Paul. Um, totally overselling me there. Um, Big time. Good to see you all here. There's quite a few more people than last time I spoke at WordCamp, which is nice to see. Um, so today I'll be um, presenting an introduction to plugin development and proving that anyone can make a plugin. Um, so hands up anyone who has made a plugin before. Cool. So I'd say about half of you. Um, who has written code for WordPress before, like uh, added code to your functions.php file or customized some CSS, something like that? Okay, so say most of you. Cool. Um, so yeah, this is an introduction to plugin development, and this is what we're going to be building. So we're going to make a really simple plugin that's going to customize the WordPress login screen and replace the WordPress branding with our own branding. Um, so is there anyone here who was intending to code along while I presented this? Anyone? Nope, cool. If you are intending to code along, because there's not much code, it's simple. Um, but yeah, just put your hand up or something if you want me to hold up so you can see all the code. Um, so me, I'm a freelance WordPress developer. Like um, Paul mentioned, I live on the Gold Coast. Um, I'm the founder of Mongoose Marketplace, which is a store for WordPress plugins. Um, so my Mongoose page plugin is used on 30,000 websites. Um, it used to be known as the responsive Facebook page plugin, but then I rebranded it and also Facebook yelled at me, so it's no longer called that. Um, you can find me online at Cameron Jones Web on all the socials. Um, so yeah, if you see that handle, it's me. Um, I made my first website back in 2006 when I was in primary school um, using Microsoft Publisher. I wouldn't recommend. Um, <laughs> I uh, started programming in 2008, making Flash games with Flash ActionScript. Uh, so that was the first time I started writing code. Um, then I went to uni and did some code and stuff and then found WordPress. Um, and quickly fell in love with it and soon after I released my first plugin on the WordPress.org repository. And um, earlier this year I released my first premium plugin. So yeah. I've, I like plugins and I've been um, writing them for some time. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm the most qualified person to talk about them though, but I, I mean, I'll take the compliment. Uh, so what I'm hoping that you'll know already is what a plugin is, um, where plugins are installed, and just a little bit of PHP. Um, so is anyone like not familiar with those? Okay, one person, um, Google. <laughs> Um, so, first thing we need, well, there's only really two things that we need to build a plugin, a uh, local development environment and a text editor. Um, so, first of all, local development environments, uh, these are the two that I would recommend using. Uh, local by Flywheel, which is a really easy to use GUI that you have to um, install and manage local WordPress sites, or Chassis, which is a more command line driven one, which is really cool and I recommend that as well, um, which is based off Vagrant, whereas uh, local uses Docker. Um, there's also plenty of others like MAMP and XAMPP and plenty of others out there, but those are the two that I recommend. Um, the other thing that you'll need is a text editor. So um, I use Sublime. Um, I, it's quite lightweight and easy to customize to like suit how you work. Um, a couple of other options are like VS Code, PHP Storm, Atom, or even the default text editor on Mac or Windows will be fine. Um, and so that's all we need, right? Um, but there's a couple of things that we should understand about how WordPress works to like have it be worthwhile making a plugin. Um, so the WordPress hook system is what WordPress uses uh, to run code at certain times, and it's the, uh, the way the hook system works is pretty much been the reason why WordPress has become as popular as it has. Uh, it, it means that WordPress is really um, flexible and easy to customize, and so that's why there's so many um, different amazing plugins out there. Um, there are two types of hooks. There's actions and there's filters. Um, so this is the syntax that you'll use for actions and filters. It's exactly the same for each one, just a different function. So you've got the hook name, so that's the name of the hook. So when a certain thing happens, that's what you'll use to reference it. Uh, a callback, so often a function, it could be uh, an anonymous function or a class or 
namespace function, any of that sort of thing, any sort of callback you can use there. Um, priority, so this is what order that it runs in, so the smaller the better, and you can even use negative numbers. Um, a default for that is 10. And arguments, which is parameters that get passed through to your callback. And um, so in the examples, you'll see how those work. Um, so an action is like an event. So a certain thing happens, and it runs an action. And so you can hook in there. And so when a certain event happens, you can run your custom code. So um, a filter, on the other hand, is like a sieve. It changes a variable rather than runs an event. Uh, so, for example, um, an action. So there's the save post action. So when you hit save on your post, um, this code will run. And for example, this would create a tweet which would say, I just saved a post on my website. I don't recommend you do that uh, because that will also run like every time it auto saves and stuff like that. So yeah, don't recommend, but that's a simple example. Whereas um, a filter, um, you can see that it is replacing hello with newt. So uh, if you have your default um, WordPress site um, that comes with the hello world post, instead of saying hello world, it'll say newt world because you know we all like Pingu. Yeah. Um, and you can see there it is returning a variable. So we've changed the title so that gets returned, um, whereas the action didn't have that because we're doing code rather than changing a value. So um, a pro tip. Uh, you can add your own hooks. Um, for example, WooCommerce is very good at this. So if you want other developers to be able to extend your plugin and not just be extending WordPress, you can add your own custom hooks and then other people can uh, extend your plugin and you can even create an ecosystem around your plugin itself. And you can learn more at that link. So now um, if we understand the hook system, um, we're right to get started on building our own plugin. Um, so the three steps to building our plugin, set up the file structure, add the plugin file header, and then write our code. Uh, so the first step, create a file structure. So in your wp-content slash plugins folder, you're gonna have to create a folder for your plugin. And inside that, um, we're gonna need to create a PHP file, which will be our main plugin file where all our code will go. Uh, a CSS file so we can change the styles and copy the logo image that we're going to use to um, replace the WordPress logo with. Um, so pro tips, uh, have a, a custom name for your um, folder, so like as custom as po possible because WordPress will try and look for that folder name on WordPress.org. So if you call yours something that already exists on WordPress.org, WordPress will update it and overwrite yours, which you probably don't want. Um, I made that mistake very early on and yeah, learned from it the hard way because I lost all my code. Uh, and it's a best practice to use the same name um, for the file as you have with the folder. And so next up, we're gonna have to add the plugin file header. So if you've added those files, and you look at your plugins page on, in your WordPress dashboard, you're not gonna see anything because WordPress doesn't know that it's a plugin yet. Uh, so this is what you add to the main PHP file in your plugin and it has all the inf important information about your plugin to make WordPress like, understand that it is a plugin. Uh, so this one is, is an example of what the file header looks like. Uh, so it's got the name, the author, um, the authors and plugin URLs, uh, current version number, description, license, and text domain, and there's a couple others that I think you can add. Uh, so it's all pretty self-explanatory that those details there are what you'll see on the plugin screen when it gets to your plugin in the list. Um, tip though, if you want to distribute your plugin, you're gonna have to license it as GPL version two or later. Uh, I don't like the GPL, but that's, um, yeah part of WordPress and um, yeah, you don't have a choice, unfortunately. Um, so next up, we're gonna start writing some code. So this is the first thing that you should do is prevent um, direct file access. So um, all this does is it checks for a constant that WordPress defines. So if someone types in the URL and you know goes, you know, your domain.com slash WP content slash plugin slash your plugin and then um, a PHP file. 
Uh, if you have this, nothing will happen. If you have some more, um, some more complicated code that would say delete files on your website or delete posts or something, and it runs when that file is accessed, you really don't want people just to be able to type in a URL and it start deleting stuff. So uh, if you add this, it means that it can only be called if WordPress is being loaded and loading your plugin properly. And so next up, we can actually start writing our code now that our plugin is safe. So um, we have a function here, uh, an introduction to plugin development, uh, WCBNE19 style sheet. And so this is the same sort of code that you would use to enqueue a style for a theme. Um, takes the same, like uses the same function, takes the same arguments, that sort of thing. Uh, we use the plugins URL function to reference style um, files within our own plugin folder. So you can see here that we're looking for the styles.css file within uh, the plugins URL, and then the second parameter is the um, PHP constant file, which is the current file. And then we're using the login and queue scripts action, and then referencing our function as the callback. Uh, pro tip for making functions is make them as unique as possible, because um, you're not the only plugin out there. So as uh, we heard in Tony's talk, there are some people who have 100 plugins on their site. So if you have a like, simple name, like save post as your function name, and someone else has that same name, like, um, it's going to break, because it's going to say, this function already exists. I don't know what to do. So um, make your function names as unique as possible to prevent um, conflicts with other people's code. So next up, we're going to want to add some styles to the uh, style sheet that we put in our folder. So uh, this is all that you'll need to replace the logo. Um, so you set the background image um, to our image that we've put in our folder. And then I've got some other code, which I think makes most images that you replace it with look a little nicer. Um, and so that goes in your style.css um, file within that folder, and the uh, URL of the background image is whatever the name of the image is that you've put there to replace the WordPress logo with. So now we'll go back to our PHP file, and so that WordPress logo will now be changed, but um, when you click on that logo, by default it'll go through to WordPress.org, and that doesn't really make sense if my logo is going through to WordPress.org. It's yeah, a bit confusing. So uh, WordPress provides a filter this time, Last time we were adding an action, so this time we're adding a filter because we want to change a value rather than add something in. And so you can see that we're replacing the uh, variable that's getting passed in, the login header URL, and we're making it my website instead of WordPress.org. And WordPress also has some link text with that logo. You probably can't see it, but screen readers will see it. and like. By default, I think it says powered by WordPress or something like that. So um, now we're adding in some more relevant text saying visit Mongo's Marketplace. And so exactly the same as when we change the URL, you set the um, text to be something different and return it and use a filter. And that's what it should look like um, once you've added that code. And so yeah, as you can see, it's pretty simple. You only need a few lines of code to get a working plugin up. Um, yeah. And I'm sure some of you are wondering, like, can you release it on WordPress.org? Um, you could, but you probably shouldn't, because um, there's a lot more uh, things that you should keep in mind if you want to distribute something on WordPress.org. Um, so a couple tips. So your plugin should adhere to the plugin guidelines. So it pretty much can be summed up with, don't do bad things, don't spam people, don't break people's sites, that sort of thing. But yeah, there's some plugin guidelines that you'll need to adhere to. Um, you'll also need to learn how to use SVN, which is a worse version of version control than Git. So uh, I only ever use SVN for WordPress.org stuff. So uh, yeah, it's not really used much anymore. So you probably won't use it other than for this. Um, you should also adhere to the WordPress coding standards. So um, WordPress has 
define coding standards for like the different languages, CSS, PHP, and JavaScript, and all that sort of thing. Um, so that code is familiar if another developer wants to look into it. Uh, this includes stuff like um, naming conventions for your files and classes and functions and um, like spacing and that sort of thing. Um, you should also make sure your plugin is able to be translated. Uh, this is something that took me a while to get my head around. Uh, so WordPress is in lots of different languages. Uh, so if someone who's not um, speaking your uh, native language uses your plugin and your plugin isn't set up to be translated, then they're going to have to learn a new language just to use your plugin. So it's always good to make sure your plugin is translatable if you want other people to use it. Um, you should, if you're using forms, you should use nonces and capability checks and escape and sanitize user inputs. Um, so making sure that your plugin is doing things securely um, and not allowing it to be exploited and things like that. Um, you can find more details on that link there. Um, so I have a um, WordPress plugin development for beginners course, which you can access at that link and you can um, take it for free. It's um, similar to what I have just presented, but it goes into a bit more depth about uh, how plugins work and um, a, a couple more of the more involved topics like uh, getting into coding standards and translating your plugin and that sort of thing. So if you're interested in taking that, that's um, the link you can follow. And for the demo code, if you want to look at the demo code that I've um, put up, you can find it at that link, and you can also find the slides there too. Thank you. Well, I stand by my, uh, my first proposition that you are one of the best plugin developers that I know. So <laughs> that was pretty cool, really well spoken. Who's going to go home and make a plug-in after tonight? Yeah, I think we all will. Cool. All right. Well, we've got um, heaps of time yeah. for Told questions. <laughs> so let's just uh, let's just yeah, questions. Ask. Hit me. Ask away. Not literally. The master. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is it worth considering using namespaces in your plugins so you can? Don't have to worry about the function name collisions. Is that, or does that bring a little bit of overhead into the whole thing? What do you recommend? Like, if you're creating a plugin, do you think in an object-oriented approach, and then not having to worry about function names, as, as, as you mentioned? Yeah, I tend to use classes. Um, I haven't really used namespaces much, but yeah, definitely use classes and namespaces if you're familiar with them. Um, it definitely helps um, with avoiding. Um, naming conflicts and means that you're writing less code in the end because, yeah, you can write your um, functions within your class or your namespace a lot shorter and that sort of thing. So, yeah, definitely a good idea. Good job, Cameron. Thank yes. you. Um, could you uh, just expand a little bit about the uh, localization? So in the code that you presented, you said that, uh, you know, that you were replacing the, I think, what, the mouse over powered by yeah. WordPress thing. Um, how would you do that? How would you make that localized? Okay, so if I go back to that code, um, that one, right? Yep. So where I have the login header text variable, I would want to wrap that in a function. So it would be underscore, underscore, and then wrap that. And that would be the first parameter. And then the second parameter would be the text domain. So if I go back to the plugin head, wait, I think I've gone past it. Um, yeah, the file header. So you'll see that last one is the text domain. So um, you declare that in the head of your plugin. And so then you use the uh, localization functions, which usually start with an underscore. Um, and so you wrap your text with that. And the first parameter will be the text you want translated. And the second parameter will be that text domain that's declared there. And then you'll need to run some sort of script to build um, PO and MO files. Um, I've got a grunt script on GitHub that does that. And so yeah, it tr um, creates a PO or MO file. And then if you are distributing on .org, WordPress like, manages the translations automatically. Um, but if you're distributing it elsewhere, you'll have to add in another function that loads in those um, language files. 
And so like, you can use a free editor like Poedit is what I use um, to actually do the translations. So um, yeah, I might have to show you how it all works sometime. <laughs> yeah, it'll probably be my next talk um, topic then. And you just put those PO files in like a subfolder on the, yeah. in the plugin? Yeah, yeah. Um, you don't have to put them in a subfolder. Um, if it's on .org, you just have to wrap them in the right functions. But yeah, if you're having like a local theme or something like that, yeah, you put them in a subfolder that has all your languages in, and then yeah, you just call another function that tells WordPress where those languages language files are. Cool. Thank you very much. All right, we have. Hey, uh, thanks for that, Cameron. Uh, question for you. At what point would you typically recommend that you create a plugin rather than adding something to a child theme? That is a very good question. Um, something that I'm sure is very subjective. Uh, typically, what you would say is anything that you want to reuse on multiple sites is better served in a plugin. So um, let's just say you have some function that you put on every site that you build or manage or whatever. Um, and it's a lot easier to just have a plugin and drop that into all your sites and activate it rather than copying and pasting that code onto all your different function files. So um, that would be my um, gauge as to whether it should be in a um, theme or a plugin. Um, there are other guidelines like um, WordPress.org says that you should only register post types in a plugin rather than a theme, that sort of thing. So um, there's some. It's not like necessary, but um, there are some recommended guidelines as well there. So yeah, if you want to reuse it on multiple sites, make it a plugin. It's yeah easy to manage, in my opinion. All right, you uh, mentioned that if you have a plugin with a particular name and then it, that matches with a name that's in the WordPress repository, yep. um, it will get overwritten. Yep. Is that, is that a problem where you have a plugin that you're using for your own stuff and then one gets added in the future to, uh, to the WordPress repository and you're not aware of it and then it kind of gets overwritten? <laughs> is that, yeah. do, do you have ways around that? Um, not off the top of my head. Um, yes, that definitely can happen and that's why um, you should always try and make it as unique a folder name as possible. Um, yeah, thankfully, the uh, one time that happened to me, it was very early on, so it didn't cost me much. But um, yeah, I, I don't really have anything in mind. Um, there are, there's probably a way of doing it, but not that I know of off the top of my head. Thank you, Cameron. That was a pretty uh, good talk. Um, this is more of a, just a fun question. Um, so what's a, a pain point or a, a plugin that you wish existed that somebody here could write for you? Um, or just, yeah, what are some other ideas that you might want to plant and see what plugins come back from people over the rest of the next few months? Cool. Um, that's a dangerous question because um, I could just keep all my ideas to myself and make more money. <laughs> um, yeah, that is a good question. Um, if someone could make a plugin that uh, removed the post meta table and changed all the meta fields into uh, columns in the post thing and split out um, post types into their own individual tables, that would be really nice because the WordPress database structure has always dro driven me insane. So just um, a quick yeah. one to get started with. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm sure someone can whip that up in the next five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Howdy, Cameron. Um, do you have any debugging tips or go-to tools? Um, good question. Um, I'd say Query Monitor is a pretty good place to start. Um, gives you like a list of every hook that runs on a page that loads. So, uh, and it like tells you PHP errors and that sort of thing. So that's usually a good place to start. Um, I know PHP Storm has some pretty cool debugging tools. 
uh, but I don't really like PHP Storm because it's really bloaty. But um, yeah, query monitor is probably a good place to start. Um, depends like what sort of thing you're looking for. Like um, you're looking for um, just whether your code works or not, or unit tests, or code standards, or yeah, is there anything in particular? Uh, mainly just debugging for, for issues is the big one, obviously. Okay, yeah, I'd, I'd say just start with query monitor. That's probably a good place to start. Cool, thank you. Um, what's the minimum due diligence in terms of uh, ensuring quality before you release? Um, that's a really good question. Um, that, that differs from person to person. Uh, <laughs> but for me, it, it's... A good person. <laughs> a good person. Um, for me, it's just, yeah, um, following the WordPress coding standards and making sure that, like, your plugin's secure and has the right, you know, capability checks and sanitization and that sort of thing. Um, it obviously differs from plugin to plugin, like that sort of plugin that I just walked through is not complicated at all, it doesn't take any user input or anything, so it's pretty fine. But um, yeah, just follow the guidelines and standards and that sort of thing that WordPress declares is pretty much the best place to start. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm coming from the other end, so I'm a project manager, more so, oh, yeah. um, and developer, front-end developer. But I do have a t couple of guys in the team who do custom plugins for us. Yep. My biggest concern, I guess, and I'm uh, apologies, early apologies, but plugin developers, like all of us, can be hit by bus. Um, yes. So <laughs> my biggest concern, I guess, is that when we have a custom plugin built, I don't want to trap our clients into relying on that plugin developer for any updates to it in the future. How, how particular is the code to the plugin developer themselves? Um, that's, yeah, good question. Um, yeah, like every plugin and plugin developer has their own mm. style and that sort of thing. But um, we do have coding standards that are recommended to be followed, so it should be at least readable and familiar enough for someone to be able to jump in. Um, so that's why those sorts of things exist, so that if you've got more than one person in a team or someone needs to take over that sort of thing, it, they can still understand the code because it should be yeah, know, I guess similar structure and that yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, that's mainly where I'm at, and I understand that there might be some time in familiarising yourself with the process yeah. of that plugin, but as long as it's a um, possibility. <laughs> yeah, definitely. In most cases. Yeah, there are some plugins that are just absolute rabbit holes and you, you're yeah. trying to figure out how they work forever. Um, but yeah, if, they, if they're following standards and guidelines and that sort of thing, they should be um, pretty right for someone to be able to jump in at least. Excellent. Good to know. Thank you. Um, there's been a few cases on with different open source plugin or tools that have open source plugins where the plugin developer has you know, a, a few thousand installs, but then they sell up to someone else and then they rewrite the plugin so it is now a hack or a yeah. backdoor or something like that. Can you talk to that at all? Um, or just your opinion on that or like how, if you've seen anything in that space? Yeah, there's a bit of that in WordPress, unfortunately. Uh, I've had a few of those people approach me. Um, and they, they couldn't offer me enough money to sell it to them because it's so obvious that they're scams. But um, yeah, it is unfortunate when that happens. And so having um, plugins like WordFence or something like that running on your um, site is a good idea because um, they'll pick up on that sort of thing. Uh, it's, it's a tough one because um, WordPress.org, like to update your plugin, um, like there's no sort of checks that it goes through. Like when you submit it, they check it. But um, once it's approved, there's um, no further checks. So that's how that sort of thing's able to um, get out. Um, unfortunately, like there's there's not much you can do uh, except like put security plugins on that will hopefully catch that. Um, it's yeah, just unfortunate uh, reality in open source software. Unfortunately. Back on the standards thing you were talking about before, is there any automated tools or anything to help adhere to those WordPress standards? Like, is there a PHP code sniffer rule set or anything that you've found helpful for what you do? 
Yeah, so um, I've got um, I've got my text editor um, will do a uh, check in the background while I'm coding and I'll flag a line if it you know doesn't meet the standards. Um, yeah, I've also got um, some uh, scripts that I've set up with like Travis and Circle CI that'll run when I deploy when I push something up into the repo and it'll run and then you know return errors all that sort of thing. So I do have some stuff on GitHub and I can send you a link if you want. Yeah. Me again. Uh, I just I just really like asking you questions because you've got such great hair. So thanks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, question, you mentioned uh, towards the start about uh, plugins that have their own hooks and stuff that you can, yep. um, you can jump onto, um, and I think you gave WooCommerce as an example of one that sort of built an entire marketplace around it. Is there anything unique that you need to know if you're looking at creating a plugin that is based around another plugin? Um, not really, just a familiarity of how that plugin works, really. Um, I, uh, custom hooks. Uh, no different to normal WordPress hooks, like it runs the same function and takes the same arguments, that sort of thing. So uh, obviously WooCommerce is very different to how WordPress core works, so um, you'd need some familiarity with how WooCommerce works and like what you're actually trying to achieve with that. Um, but yeah, just some familiarity with how that plugin works is all you'd really need. Yeah, excuse me. Um, just uh, got, got, got a question regarding PHP versions and um, and plugins. Yep. Um, what's uh, WordPress's policy as far as as uh, plugins keep, keep keeping up to date with uh, with uh, the current release of PHP? Yeah. So WordPress um, recommends version at least five um, seven point oh. Um, I write my stuff to work with um, at least 5.6 or up. Um, the official stance is that it's recommended that you um, that you have 7.0 or more. Um, there's no uh, sort of policy or anything enforced though. So like, if you want to write your plugin to only support PHP 7.3 and up, then that's fine. And if you want to support all the way back to PHP 4, that's also fine. It's um, yeah, nothing's really enforced, but it is recommended that it's um, from 7.0 up. All right. We've got time for a couple more questions, guys, if you have any. Or we could just get food. <laughs> uh, yeah, just to, um, so there's a lot of hooks and filters out there, and obviously that's the kind of bread and butter of what you're going to build. Yep. Um, and you mentioned obviously WooCommerce or other kind of platforms that provide those. Um, so do you have any kind of go-to resources that you go to to find out what's available and to kind of um, work out how you're going to go about solving your problem? Um, some of it just comes from guessing, honestly. Uh, some of it's just guessing, like WordPress like is pretty consistently named, so you can guess that like when a post is saved, it's the saved post action. Um, if you use Query Monitor, it'll um, output a log of every single hook that runs, so you can go through and trace like you know this runs at this time, so you know this would be a good hook to add things on. Um, a lot of the documentation has like recommended hooks to use for like certain things, like you use the WP and Q scripts to enqueue your JavaScript and CSS, for example. Um, yeah, if you want to see a list of all the hooks, you use like Query Monitor or something like that. Um, yeah, other than that, just dig into the code. Um, that's what I find myself doing a lot is just yeah, going through rabbit holes of other plugins code if I want to change something. All right, I've got a question for you. No. <laughs> do, do you get plugin envy? In, in what way? Well, like when you sort of see a plugin that's been developed and you go, oh, that's really good. I really wish I'd done that. Or, you yeah. know, like, I love the code. You look at it and go, wow, that's amazing. Did, yeah. did you get that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I kind of made an inferior version of Gutenberg a few years ago. So, yeah, I'm shaking my fists at automatic. <laughs> right. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.
personal question. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, well, we might wrap up there. Um, the other session starts in 10 minutes. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, so thank you. Thank you, Cameron. Um, yeah, please.